So, Paul, how's the apocalypse going for you? I'm still waiting for it to start. This is... I'm having a great time. Same here. I've stopped reading the news. I was very... <laughs> Excellent. Good for you. I, every morning I'd check the news and like, all right, let's see, how are we doing? Oh, the numbers are... Oh, the numbers are down. Oh, the numbers are better. Oh, they're worse. Oh, we, sh we don't need masks. No, we're supposed to wear masks. Oh, this won't help. Oh, that's... No, we should... That'll definitely help. Oh, everybody should do that. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. And so I'm tired of the story changing and numbers going around and nobody knows what's going on. So, whatever. Uh, just stay inside and wait for this to all blow over. Yeah, that's what I've been doing too. So, I don't really have any games to talk about this week because I've just been playing Cities Skylines. And I don't have much to say about the game that I haven't already said. It's a good game. Did you download the mod that, like, makes all the crematoriums magical? I did. Well, there's one that just poofs bodies away. And just that go. entire mechanic is gone. And you know what? I forgot I installed it until you mentioned it. Like, who cares? Like, that entire gameplay mechanic is completely superfluous. Totally needless. Does not improve the experience in any way. Actually, I have a rant. So, I've been working on this city this week and having a great time and I've been really trying to fill out the map. You know, everybody starts and you make this really big, you know, Manhattan style city. And then as you get out to the edge of the map, you're like, okay, that's too much city. Maybe I'll do some suburbs. And I got done, done with the suburbs, suburbs and the city was tapering off nicely. You know, it looked natural. It was, didn't look like my early cities in this game would just be this wall of maximum height buildings and then boom, straight down to house height when you cross the street, right? Right. And, you know, learning how to manipulate the zoning to get that tapering off effect where you have super dense and moderately dense scattered and then suburbs. And, it, oh, it looks so good. I just love it. But while I was doing that, I was like, you know what? I've never built a farm before. I should build some... I mean, I, I dabbled with it, but I'd like... I'm going to build some rolling green fields out here. And so I built, you know, the first farm, which is several acres. And it's sort of like each acre, it just picks a random thing. Oh, this acre is some sort of growing crop, and this one is cows, and this one, I don't know what this is, and this is some sort of pasture, and this is, like, a, a building, probably with chickens in it. Or so, so, this is a very confused, this is a very eclectic farm. You know, you don't have control over what's in it. And that's sort of annoying. I, yeah. I pictured, like, this vast green blanket of growing things. And what I got was just sort of this scatter shot one of everything style farm but fine but it kept complaining not enough workers not enough workers and i'm like well i i put a house there in the corner of the farm all right i'll, I'll give the house more room and it'll probably put a couple houses there but that's fine still not enough workers none of them like hang on there's like four families living here and so i click on the farms how many farmers do you think it would take to care for one acre, Paul? Like, just, what's a reasonable number of workers for a single acre? So that's an interesting question because when uh, we live in a, an area where there are farms around, the big fields of uh, vegetables and strawberries and all kinds of stuff, and most of the time you don't need anyone out in the field. It's just like, a guy on a tractor every other week or something spraying. I mean, I'm not watching the fields all day long, but there's there's not a lot of work going on. Right, that's my impression too. But, but for crops that require hand picking at harvest time, there are a ton of people out there because you got to get the whole thing harvested because they're all ripe all at the same time because you plant them all at the same time. So at that point, you need like maybe 50, 100 guys an acre. But it's like this burst of activity, and then the rest of the year, it's, well, nothing. Right. Well, Cities Skyline seems to think that farms require 16 people per acre year-round. Oof. Wow. 
16, it's just the most baffling. What they did is they just took the factory asset, you know, the factories in the game, it's, they're just all smokestack factories. And it says, sure. this is a box factory, this is a toy factory, but it's just a bunch of smokestacks. Every industry makes smoke. It doesn't matter what you're making. <laughs> Clouds of Victorian era black smoke, like coal smoke, coal soaring suit. to the heavens. Yeah, just like... Uh, it, the game explicitly has a says the date, and it starts in 2020. So this is a modern era game, but all factories spew black smoke out into the heavens for some reason. I've worked at I've worked at, at a number of industries, and uh, the environmental restrictions here in the U.S. are so stringent that the air that that they discharge from their industrial processes is cleaner than the air that in the offices. Like it's. Right. Very, very clean. <laughs> right. And you can't, like, enact those... You cannot enact that sort of rule in cities and say, okay, don't put black smoke in the atmosphere while you're, you know, while you're making ice cubes or whatever it is you're making. <laughs> right. <laughs> and for power plants, it's like, okay, maybe you'd be spewing smoke out. But like for almost all other industrial processes, especially nowadays, like there's they don't even need to produce soot. Right. And so all factories produce are just soot factories that coat the area in soot. Like the the ground turns this awful gray color everywhere. As if this was, you know, early 20th century. And it's really annoying. You cannot stop it. Th that's already broken. But then when they made farms, all they did was just copy and paste the f existing farm functionality. So now you're instead of, or the existing factory. So now instead of 16 guys working in a smokestack factory to make ice cubes, you've got 16 guys working on a field. I don't know if they're building the plants by hand or whatever. It makes no, no sense. That's not right. I, they must have. Are you sure? That sounds. That's ridiculous. It is so stupid. Like I, I, I made, you know, like an eight, an eight acre farm. Now that is not a big farm. No, that's like enough room for one cow, barely. R right. That is a very modest farm. Eight acres is incredibly tiny. That would be like. That would be. One farmer, just one dude, maybe you'd have to bring in some, some people at harvest time to help out. Right, but his and, neighbors would come over and help, so it's like, it's not right. even unusual. Right, and according to the game, that farm would take 128 people to run. <laughs> How, okay, like, so in city skylines, what do they eat? Right, but the thing is, that the other thing is, the... The farm just pumps out crops every day. Like, so I got this farm working by putting a huge apartment tower right next to it. <laughs> just just this like giant <laughs> inner a city. Skyscraper condominium. Right. Right next to the farm to house all the people that would be needed in this farm. So the whole thing got working. And then trucks began pouring out of each acre is basically a building, right? They just took the existing 4x4 factories and replaced them with with fields, you know, cow sure. pens or whatever. And each one of them begins generating all of these 18-wheelers that immediately jump on the dirt road and form a traffic jam. There are so many, <laughs> they can't get... They are in each other's way. <laughs> And I'm like, this, like, a couple of squares of farm is, like, there's no way to make a, a fields of farm that stretch on and on, like you see in real life. You just put a few squares of farm down and you're basically done and that feeds the entire city, I think. <laughs> it's just this, it could, as, as long as you can as, install enough roads. So what you've got to do is take those dirt roads and replace them with four-lane highways. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, so this is like like tiny little postage stamp farms everywhere. Not like one big farm, but like tiny little postage stamp farms. And then they're just like some sort of crazy industrial farm factory pumping out trucks. Right. 
do there are right. there empty trucks that come in to pick stuff up or do they just generate trucks I think they generate what happens is within the game stuff gets generated one place and delivered elsewhere so a truck will like drive to the docks and deliver its good and then the truck itself just poofs out of existence but sometimes trucks go back to where they came from and I think that was the problem at my farm was I had a bunch of empty trucks coming back and I had you know full trucks going out and it was just this chaos zone of just endless trucks everywhere it was ridiculous for what would normally be like a a family farm like i think in the old days it was like four acres was about one family sized but this required hundreds of <laughs> hundreds of people <laughs> So you right. might as well put the farm downtown. There's no there's no reason to put it out in the boonies because you need all those people and all the infrastructure to get the stuff out. It's a dumb, broken system, and I hate it. And for whatever reason, there are no mods that fix it. Like, what I want Again, is a the, farm. Do the farms at least not produce soot like all the under the industries? They, that, that is one good thing. They don't produce soot. So that's nice. I would love a mod that just cuts th the farm down to 1 16th. Instead of 16 guys, it needs one guy. And instead of, you know, 16, a truck every day, it's a truck every 16 days. That would be a much, much better thing. And then I, I, I wish I could choose what I was growing. <laughs> oh, like zone it for specific crops or something. Right. But I, I would settle for just divide everything by 16 so that, you know, you don't have this urban farm nonsense. Right. Well, that ate, up, that ate up way too much of the show. Um, if anybody, I looked for mods to deal with this. If anybody knows of any mods that help, please tell me in the comments below because this is driving me crazy. I want my farmlands. All right. Now we're getting into the mailbags, and from here it's all mailbags. Here we go. Dear Diecast, I found an interesting blog about games lying to players to improve the experience. I'll have a link to this blog post in the show notes. A few examples from the post. Amnesia contains a tip that monsters can find you easier when you have low sanity, which is not true. I had no idea. I was always terrified at low sanity. I had no idea it actually doesn't matter if you're going insane. Wow. In Batman, in the Batman Arkham trilogy, mooks spend most of their time posturing and position themselves so that you can keep your combo going. For me, that's just... I mean, movies do the same thing. You watch the hero kung fu fight ten people, and they're interacting with two people and everybody else is just standing a few feet away bouncing up and down threateningly like i i don't consider that dishonest that's just how fictional fights work yeah and even in the elevator scene from uh with captain america or whatever where he fights like all those guys in the elevator and they're right. all attacking him visually convincingly if you like stop the movie and like frame by frame through it you can see that a bunch of the guys are like coordinating with other guys so that they strike at the same time so you can block at the same time and stuff like it's it's not real it looks pretty good but it's not actually that's not how people would try to take someone down right there would be a lot of shouting this guy's like get him get him no oh, he's got my neck he's got <laughs> right they, they'd be like communicating with each other so they could coordinate but of course that would just ruin the fight it would just be the this cacophony of shouting yeah, well, and, you know, like, two guys would attack his head and two guys would attack his knees, and it's like, what is he going to do? He's going to block all of them at once? No, he'd, he'd take it down. So, yeah, you can't you can't really make a realistic fight where one guy takes on a whole gang because you lose right. that fight. Like, that's not a winnable situation. Uh, continuing with the email, Fire Emblem displays wrong two-hit chances. Player characters actually roll twice with the displayed chance. So 90% is actually 99%. Man, XCOM needs that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yikes. Um, the XCOM, the new ones. Because it feels like it goes the other way. It feels like it's lying to you about how good your <laughs> odds are. Yeah. Yeah. What are your opinions on stuff like this? 
Person uh, personally, I wouldn't even classify the second thing as a lie. It's pretty off obvious that Batman Mooks follows some fight scene choreography protocol. The hit chance thing is something that really bugs me, though. If a game shows me a probability, I don't want it to be fudged according to some ad hoc theory about how normal people interpret prob probability. Why not make it green, yellow, red if you just want to convey some intuitive idea? That's an interesting idea. I knew the Fire Emblem thing, but one of the reblogs points out, I assume he means commenters, that the XCOM remake invisibly adjusts hit chances except when playing on hard, so you might bump up against the difficulty and notice that you hit less often than you're used to without knowing why. That seems even worse. Oh, there you go, the XCOM uh, thing. Happy Easter, RFS81. So I, I'll add one to this. I don't know if you call it lying, but the way Half-Life sort of invisibly helps you and hurts you, if you're doing really good, enemies become more accurate and they do more damage. And if you're doing really badly, even you know a minor health pack will give you tons of health. And while you're running around in chaos, you don't notice this. And I consider that sort of a deception. We, Through years of experience, we've come to expect that... You know, little health packs give you a little bit of health, and big health packs give you a lot of health. But really, the whole system is just being manipulated so that you're doing good, but not too good. To sort of funnel everybody into a into the intended, uh, you're, you're doing okay, but you, you shouldn't relax too much. And the ammo availability also varies too, right? Like right. you break open a, a crate or something, if you're low on ammo, it'll magically just have that kind of ammo in there. It's like, wow, amazing. So I don't know. I It's hard to say. It's easy to say, hey, this makes me uncomfortable. I don't like it. But when I didn't know that I was being lied to, it was working. I didn't know that going insane in amnesia was harmless. So I really worried about sanity and I, you know, at some points in the game, your, your vision begins swimming and when it gets really bad. You see bugs everywhere and it started to really make me uncomfortable and I was like really scared. And so that was totally working. That system worked to create tension, which is the entire goal of the game. That game isn't a mechanical challenge. The goal of the game is to create an emotional state in the player. And that helped. So, I don't know. I guess I'm okay with lying as long as I don't catch you. <laughs> I feel like there's a, a distinguish that needs to be made between lying per se and just uh, misleading implications. So like the, the Fire Emblem thing where it just displays the wrong hit chance or or the same thing in XCOM where it displays the wrong hit chance. Uh, I don't like that. Like you said, if you're going to tell me some detailed information, make sure the details are right. I, I don't want to have to guess at what you're fudging there. Yeah, especially when you're displaying a number. I think I think that's a good point. When you're displaying numbers, the numbers should be the truth. I don't mind the health pack healing you more when you're when you're more damaged. In fact, you could even cook up lore to or some justification to justify that. But sure. If if it was lying about your health, like I actually have 20 hit points but the display at the bottom says 10 to get me to be more careful, I wouldn't like that. It's true. Ch fudging numbers is is more trouble it bothers me but fudging like things like insanity in amnesia i i don't really mind that yeah that's kind of a, a weird gray area because if it says in the in the dialogue or in the tutorial or whatever that a mechanic exists that doesn't actually exist like that makes me feel uncomfortable and i i don't know i feel like i would play with it and find out that it was lying to me, and then I would have a problem with the whole game, because like, oh, well, what else is not real? Right. Right. So, I'm curious what other people think of this, too. Are we going to see this this schism in, in gaming as people, you know, think about this? I want the mechanics to just be open and honest, or eh, I don't mind if it's trying to evoke, an, you know, 
create an emotion I don't mind being lied to by the game. Yeah, well, and there's another thing where if the game lies to you and lampshades it and makes it obvious, like in Portal, where uh, GLaDOS right. tells you something and then like it's clearly not true, and then she jokes about it later, and it's like, okay, well, so now we know that the the narrator or the you know the voiceover on the on the intercom is an unreliable source of information, and so then it's kind of funny because she'll tell you all kinds of things. And you're like, oh, is that true or not? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. So if the game, it, like in Amnesia, if it told you a bunch of things and uh, and then some of them were just blatantly false, then it would be okay for them to tell you other things and then be false because it's like, oh, it's established that you know they gave me a basis in on which to disbelieve them. It's an interesting question. And to a certain extent, I think it depends on what you're playing the game for. You know, as to how okay. It's it's almost like plot twists, like plot twists kind of lie to you, mislead you. Mm, yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, that's okay as long as, as there's a payoff for it. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and yeah. this would be more like an unreliable narrator where the, like a, a story tells you right. something that just is not true at all. And it's like, is that okay? Well, uh, like I said, I feel like it's okay if it's established that it's an unreliable narrator. I don't want to be reading like a crime story or something and with all these details and trying to piece together the mystery. And then halfway through, it turns out that the guy is insane that's telling the story. And we like cut to the framing narrative of like, you know, his, his therapist or something like I, I would feel cheated at that point. Right. All right. Dear Diecast, I like Final Fantasy VIII. However, I will readily admit the game has severe issues and is just not as good as, say, Final Fantasy VI, a.k.a. Final Fantasy III. I'd call it one of my guilty pleasures, a game I like better than it actually is. Do you guys have games like that where you like it despite knowing it's not very good? Does a game having obvious flaws just ruin the entire experience for you? Paul, you go first. You have any games that are crap, but you like them anyway? One that springs immediately to mind is Hob. I just uh, played it this last week. I talked about it, I think, in the last diecast. Uh, I beat the game this last week, and, and uh, I mean, it's, it's a great game. I, I really enjoy it. At the same time, it's a terrible game. It's it's not well put together. It's got unforgiving 3D platforming. The combat is very slugfesty. You you figure out the gimmick of the fight, and then you just have to keep executing it for another like 18 sword swings. And uh, there's a lot of unskippable animations. And because the animations in this game are like really involved and fancy, which is one of the reasons I love the game. Uh, but they're really long and involved, and so like when you can't skip them, it's just like oh, God, this this door unlocking animation again. Come on, right. let me just skip this and you know run through and explore this next place or whatever. Or especially like trying to travel around the map and you get in the teleporter and the teleporter's got all these moving parts and it like clunks around and goes down into the ground before you can open up the map. But like you accidentally walk into the teleporter. And it's like, oh, no, now I have to watch this twice, once when it goes down to the ground, and then I cancel, and then it goes then it goes back out, and then I run slightly the wrong direction and get back in the teleporter, and I have to watch it two more times. Ah! And you can't even right. remap the keys. Like, the game doesn't, it has a, a key display, but it doesn't let you remap anything. So if you want to remap it, you got to, like, do it with an outside tool or something. So it's, like, it's really annoying in a lot of ways, and it's not a great game. But it's a great game, and I love it. For me, um, one of my guilty pleasures is fighting games. Now, people say, no, no, the fighting games are great. All oh, these, say, yeah, but I it, maybe they're great, but the parts of them that are great, that fans love, you know, and they play in tournaments, that's not what I love. I literally get fighting games, put them on the easiest possible difficulty, and then just run through all the characters and beat up all the other characters. Like, <laughs> I just love the uh, animations. Uh, who's who of unnecessary violence. Yes, exactly. All right, that's what happens when guy A beats up guy B. But what happens if guy B beats up guy A? That'll be a totally different experience. I don't learn how to play the games. I don't learn how to do the fancy combos. I mean, I learn enough to play on the easiest difficulty. And I have a great time doing that. But I am 
that's definitely a guilty pleasure for me. And, you know, the story is always atrocious and things are often badly translated and there's all sorts of weirdness and jank and complicated systems that I'm ignoring. And, yeah, so that's a gu guilty pleasure for me is just sort of stomping my way through a fighting game. It's, it's also a guilty pleasure because that's really expensive. Like, you pay 40 or $60 for a game and the way I play it, it's basically lasts one or two hours. You know, how long does it, you know, how much fun is there playing is the easiest possible difficulty. There's, there's not much there. So for me, the games are incredibly shallow, but I love watching the animations. Uh, I also like to really, uh, I don't want to call it trashy, but it was definitely not a complicated game. It was called Fist of Awesome where you're a lumberjack with one giant fist and you just punch like bears and it's just <laughs> walk to the right. It's like a classic brawler like you'd see in the arcade, except you really only have one or two moves and it's incredibly repetitive, but I don't know. It made me happy. So those are my guilty pleasures. Dear Diecast, I've been playing through Doom Eternal and I've been loving it but I wanted to ask your opinion specifically on that cutscene. All right, so I, kn I know what this is. Um, for those of you who haven't played Doom Eternal, if you plan on doing so, then just skip to the next timestamp or skip forward like five minutes because we're going to spoil like a mid-game scene. You know the one where Doom Slayer is confirmed to be Doom Guy and speaks for the very first time. I've heard a few people call this sequence cringe, say it ruins his mystique from the 2016 Doom, among other things. I personally find it inoffensive and cute, kind of cute in a way, like it was solely crafted to make fans laugh and smile. That's my opinion, but I'd like to hear yours. Happy ripping and tearing, Caden. So, I know you haven't played this, but for co context, way back in the 90s, there was a tie-in comic book for Doom. Oh, sure. Of course. Because they didn't have, like, cross-media promotion and stuff, so they had to go out of their way to try to get more fans. Sure. And it, I don't know, I never read it myself, but I've seen the page in question where the Doom guy is, like, half-crazed and punching things to death. Maybe he just took the Berserk power up and a Baron of Hell comes out and he just says something about he wants to tear somebody's guts out and then he sees the Baron of Hell and he's, oh, you're huge. That means you have huge guts. <laughs> it was just such a goofy line. Like, you have huge guts. Um, okay. And that was in the comic. So there's a call, there's a scene in the middle of this game that's a flashback to the Doom guy getting his Doom guy powers. Like I always just thought he was a really good space marine, but no, this game like says no, his powers were bestowed on him by this cult for I'll be honest, I got sick of reading the lore book, so I don't know why this co this cult exists or what their goal is. I just know Doom guy wandered in and they wanted him to arena fight with some of the other stragglers. And he said huge guts. He said somebody had huge guts during this scene as a callback to the comic. I recognize the okay. callback. This is like in a scene with cultists. So it's out of context from the comic. Right. This is just a, the same line delivered in a completely different circumstance. The line still doesn't make any sense, by the way. <laughs> Neither context affords it the the gravitas that it apparently deserves. Right. I didn't care, but I was like, just let me play the game. I don't care. I don't care about this bullshit. I just want... And it's not that I never cared. The one scene that they spoiled in the trailer where the Doom guy arrives on the station at Mars and everybody reacts to him like, holy shit, it's him. And everybody's like staggering to get out of your way and terrified. And you just sort of like push past everybody. He has lots of little visual comedy moments. And I really liked that scene. But I didn't like any of the other ones. And Doom guy saying somebody has huge guts and 
whatever. I just didn't care. I just... So, how did I feel about this scene? I, you know, flicked my hand to, to loosen it up because it was getting a little crampy. Because this game requires a lot from you. Uh, and, you know, just waited for my hand to recover for the moment where it threw me back to the demon shooting and ripping and tearing. So that's what I thought of it. Whatever. You didn't skip it, but not because you wanted to see it. Because you were using it as total dead air in your quest for demon's death. Also, I'm 85% sure you can't skip it. What? You can't skip cutscenes? Like any of them or just that one? I'm pretty sure you can't skip any. These are all in engine. These are not like pre made movies. And so it right, just it has but, to play out. Huh. I mean, it, <laughs> theoretically, it should be even easier to skip an in engine cutscene than one that's pre rendered. I'm not sure. I don't remember skipping any of them. And I don't remember. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, the whole game's a blur. Like, wow, that game just... I don't even just... remember playing this game. I, I don't even know <laughs> well, what no, I, I did. I remember playing this game, and I remember saying very... Just running through my entire collection of naughty words every time a marauder showed up. Because, boy, <laughs> are those things no fun to fight. Ugh. Not, did not enjoy. Would um, not recommend marauders. No. No fun. Archviles also suck. They are not... They are not like the old Arch Files. They are also not any fun. So, yeah. So you had checked out of the, the cutscene, so this one in particular didn't offend you in any particular way. Did you yeah. note him speaking? I mean, did he speak at all throughout the rest of the game? Or did no, this never begin spoke. his... Yeah, he never spoke in the game, and he only spoke in this one flashback. Okay, so this wasn't like the beginning of his holding forth on many topics. It was just like they they broke his silence for a dumb callback to a dumb scene in a comic book that they did not maintain the context for and wasn't interesting in either context. That sums it up perfectly. I was unoffended, but then I was not into the story, so who cares? Like, as some people took their, took it a little more seriously, and they really didn't like what this game did to the Doom guy. Um, having him receive powers and having him speak and sort of... It, it's almost like when you break a silent... When a silent protagonist breaks their silence, you have definitively nailed down what their voice sounds like and what their... Not just their their vocal cords, what they sound like, but kind of how they speak. What's their accent? Are they flippant? Are they friendly? Are they just filled with rage? Are they stoic? You nail down a personality as well as the voice. And that gives the player less space to sort of project what they thought the character was like. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I understand if, I mean, I had the same thing with, Half-Life 2, I was like, oh, I hope they never give Gordon Freeman a voice. Because I always projected myself. Quiet, introspective, not a lot to say. I realize that's hard to believe since I host this podcast and I, I practically filibuster you week after week. <laughs> yeah, but this is the only time you talk every week, right? You're saving it all right. up. <laughs> right, right, right. Normally, I don't have a lot to say on things, unless I have a lot to say. If you get me on one of the topics, I can't stop to stop talking about. But I don't usually feel the need to just, like, tell everybody about the weather. Right. It, if you were Gordon Freeman, you wouldn't, like, walk into Nova Prospect and just start talking to the Ant Lions. Hey, guys, how's it going? Wow, look at this architecture, right? Oh, yeah, my boys, go get them. Like some stupid macho thing. And if they gave him a voice, the odds of him, re you know, reflecting the voice I always had in my head are very low. They would want to make him a very colorful and vibrant character. And it would obliterate the character that I've been pre creating for him. And so I can kind of understand, you know, some people had a character in mind for Doom Marine. And if this scene didn't match, then yeah, 
I understand why they'd be frustrated. So you would be frustrated too if, like, halfway through Half-Life 2, uh, Alex Vance walks in and your character just comments on her huge guts? <laughs> you have huge guts. She'd be like, um, I don't know how to take that. <laughs> Maybe it's a compliment in this weird alternate universe. Who knows? Oh, boy. Dear Diecast, have you heard of a game called Scorn? It's not been released, but there's a trailer and a bit of information out. The game is essentially explore HR... Is it Geiger or Giger? I've heard both. I have only ever read his name. Okay. HR Cigar. Nightmare World <laughs> as a weird biomechanical guy fighting weird biomechanical horror monsters with weird biomechanical guns. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but the, the, the idea is it was supposed to come out in 2018 and it is still a no-show and we don't even have a date and we haven't heard anything in the last two years. I just heard of it when I got this email. Never heard heard of it before this moment. I watched the trailer and I thought it was fascinating. Oh, this is regards Castrellius. Last time this person sent in a message, I said, wait, isn't that the bad guy from the Doctor Strange movie? And so this time they have corrected me. No, that's Caecilius. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for filling us in, Castrelius. Um, very sporting of you. Thank you. I didn't know this game existed, but now I'm sad it hasn't come out. Isn't this? Isn't this just? Isn't this like just Warframe? I I don't know. Is it? No, no. It looks. So, I mean, Warframe kind of has that biomechanical look. This thing leans way into it, like classic '80s HR. Puff and stuff. No, wait. H.R. Giger or Geiger or Cigar. Um, it leans into that look more than anything else since the original Alien movie. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm watching trailer now. And yeah, this is more bio than mechanical, I think. Right. Everything's made out of meat. Even your gun is made out of meat. It's very disturbing. The one thing I find interesting is is that this is a rare game that I don't think you could have done properly until the modern day. Like, we needed, you needed good graphics to make this work because so much of it is about the texture. And even like eight years ago, we were still struggling with games where everything looked like dull plastic. We needed to get to the, to the point where you can look at a surface and say, wow, that really is brushed metal, and that really is human flesh. Like, it needs a very particular type of specularity mapping that just we weren't doing back in, let's say, the Bioshock days. Not that Bioshock tried to do this. I'm just like, that era of gaming. If, yeah, if anything, they need to wait a couple more years, because there's, I don't see any subsurface scattering, which would just put the icing on this particular right. fleshy pulsing cake also that's a this looks like it may be pre-rendered or it's unreal engine 4 which is no i you know, believe uh, it i'm oh i don't know which one i'm watching the teaser trailer from 2016 um but this look i believe it's in engine i mean it's, it's very high texture density but if you don't have too many objects in the scene i think you could pull it off yeah i suppose if it's from 2016 yeah uh then yeah, certainly today's computers ought to be able to do it. Um, it's very weird. I'm sad we haven't heard more about it. Um, I'd love to see more of that game. Um, but it really does seem, like you said, it, it really... Flesh is hard, I think, is the main thing here. Flesh is one of the hardest things to render. Harder than hair. Yeah, well, because you harder see it than all fabric. the time. Right, and it has very... Flesh has very particular qualities to it that you don't get from like wood you know being able to shine a flashlight through your hand and have it glow red that's that's happening all the time yeah. around your ears you know your your ears yeah that's light the, the subsurface is, scattering is that right. when the light goes into it and then it doesn't go through it and it's not refracted it kind of diffuses through the the surface 
Right, and the moment you don't have, like, you, you don't think it's a big deal, but the moment it's off, everybody looks sort of plasticky because their ears are totally opaque. And you wouldn't think it matters, but that on the face, which we are so sensitive to faces, and this game is all about zooming in on horribly mutated faces, <laughs> showing them up close in all their fleshy bits. So, yeah, this game is a game that needs the latest rendering tech. Maybe that's part of the reason it's been delayed. I didn't know I wanted to play it until now. I absolutely do not need this game in my life. I'm not interested in playing right. it at all. But it is an impressive technical achievement. Uh, except that they haven't actually achieved it yet because it's not out. Right. And there's no news, so now we're all waiting. Just to find out, is it cancelled? What? <laughs> yeah, it's strange. I, my guess would be that they just didn't secure enough funding for it and are waiting for more investors. Right. And it's not even clear. I mean, the game itself could still be terrible. I mean, you know, all we have is a visual <laughs> right. to go on. You can't yeah. just carry an entire game on a visual style. You need good gameplay or you'll get sick of it. I mean, arguably this game would make you sick even if it had good gameplay, but... The right. <laughs> Right. Oh, when you reloaded the gun by, like, inserting the fleshy bit into the other fleshy bit, I was like, wow, that is... Put the chicken leg inside the ham to reload your gun, and it was, like, all squishy and making squishy, fleshy noises. I'm like, wow. This will... Do you could use this as an appetite suppressant. Yeah, weight loss right here. Yeah. Dear Diecast. Actually, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Here's how they've written it. Dear Diecast! I don't know why you capitalized it, but okay. I enjoyed hearing you talk about the new Doom game. Doom V? Actually, it should be Doom Eternal. I have had a lot of fun with Doom 2, but never played Doom. Is it worth checking out, or would you miss the Super Shotgun too much? Also, I would love to hear your thoughts on the 2D Duke Nukem games. Sincerely, Bad Ideas. P.S. Happy Easter. Oh wait, that was cancelled, wasn't it? I don't know. It depends on who you ask. I haven't watched the TV. They'll probably tell me it was canceled one day and it's not canceled the next day. And then the next day they'll tell you we're having two Easters. <laughs> Double Easter. Um, so I actually think Doom, aside from the Super Shotgun, is a delight to use. But I am not in love with Doom 2. I think Doom 1 is the stronger game. I think it has much better levels. I think way too much of Doom 2 just is random bricks and blood. And there's, it's all sort of shapeless and confusing. And there was a sense of place about the first Doom that made the environments much more interesting. And much less just like a fever dream. Now maybe that you know maybe that's like entirely appropriate but I enjoyed the first Doom way more. So I highly recommend especially the first episode. Those are those are my favorite Doom levels of the of the old games. Paul, did you ever get it? How old were you when the first Doom came out? Uh, Doom was right when I was uh, getting old enough to appreciate it. Uh, my parents never let me play it, and I've never gone back to it because I'm not really a fan of first-person shooters. But uh, I think Errant Signal is doing a review of the original Doom in his next episode. So if you want to wait for that to come out, you could watch it and see what he thinks, too. How did you find out this secret knowledge? Because he mentioned it at the end of his last series episode. Oh. Have I missed an episode? For me, I was like wondering if he wasn't stopped putting out videos. I was like, it's been a couple months. Did YouTube stop showing me stuff that I am subscribed to? <laughs> I don't Damn know. YouTube. I, I, uh, I think the last episode was Wolfenstein 3D. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. So thanks, YouTube. I don't know what it is with you and YouTube. It always shows me my subscriptions. I have a lot. Maybe it's just oh, like, okay. you don't really want to be subscribed to 30 different things. I'll just show you these six over and over again. <laughs> that you've already watched. Oh, boy. Dear Diecast, do you ever find yourself putting a game down before finishing it? Yes, all the time. Oh, wait. Let me finish reading the question. 
not because it's bad, but rather due to feeling like you've gotten everything you can out of it and not seeing a reason to continue. My personal examples would be Dusk, after the first episode, the original flashback, after winning the ticket back to Earth in the Running Man-esque level. I've, I have no knowledge of this game, flashback. Hang on, I want to look this up because I'm curious. Okay, so flashback is... This is very confusing. 1992, but then all of the footage and screenshots it's showing me are very obviously not 92. So it looks like this got a remake recently that's poisoning the search results. Yeah, that's not 92. I don't know. Maybe that's that could be 256 color mode. I don't know. No, that's a, that's a 1080 image. All right. I don't know what the deal is with flashback. I've never heard of it. How did I get this far in life and I've never heard of this this game? Anyway, getting back to this email. I enjoyed both but stopped playing each with a sense of, okay, that's what it is. Cool. I get it. Let's play something else now. Yeah, I actually had the same thing with Dusk. I did not, even though I made Dusk one of my games of the year um, last year, I didn't finish it. I, I felt like, okay, I've had enough of that. That was really good, a really good throwback to the classic games, but I'm done. I'm kind of like that with Satisfactory. Um, Legend of Grimrock is another one I never finished, although I really enjoyed it. I just sort of like, all right, that's enough walking through block mazes. Yeah, so, I, I felt the same way actually about Factorio and City Skylines, where good game, I enjoyed it, played it, you know, about... A little ways and then it was like I get it I've seen enough if I want to see more I can just watch someone else's playthrough late game thing or whatever I'm not gonna play this again or or not necessarily I'm not gonna play this again but just like I'm not gonna play it anymore right now and then I just never really got back to it right and it's not like you can I mean there are games I put down just because they sucked but there are a lot of games, like Dusk, I can't point to anything it does wrong. The thing is, it, you know, I just got tired of it. But it was just faithfully recreating a 90s shooter. And to answer the other question, I don't even remember the 2D Duke Nukems. I'm pretty sure I played them. I, I remember what 2D Duke looked like. But I don't remember anything about the games, what the monsters were like, what the environments were like. All I remember is what 2D Duke looked like. Um, no memory of it whatsoever. Hmm. So, I don't know. I, I think if I loved it, I would remember it better. I think part of it is when the game uh, shows you that it's not going to introduce new mechanics or or new uh, relatively new scenarios or something like that where you get the feeling that okay i've seen everything the game has to offer even though i'm going to get bigger and better things later on like with my two examples factory and city skylines at least for me uh in those two examples like both games give you the tutorial they give you how to interact with stuff and then they give you some upgrades but the upgrades are basically just like different versions of the same thing you've already been doing. Bigger roads, bigger buildings, uh, you know, bigger waste disposal plants. And it's like, okay, I, I got it. I, I don't need a bigger version. It's the last thing, only more so. Yeah, and I don't know, it, it, there's... You know how we were talking earlier about games that lie to you? I feel like uh, part of a game having a, an extended set of mechanics or an extended length of time over which you can play something it part of the implicit promise it's making is that there will be a change up at each expansion it's not just a bigger thing it's not just more numbers like candy crunch or whatever yes there are more numbers but it introduces new kinds of blocks and new kinds of power-ups and stuff like that now it's still a dumb game but at least it's it's right. adding something every time and, it's a different uh, dumb game later on. Right. And and for some games, it adds those, but it's just not quite enough. Like in like you mentioned Satisfactory, where like, okay, you get a, a, a bigger factory that has more inputs. Is that enough? Well, for some people it is, and for some people it isn't. 
Um, for me, I, I enjoyed it enough to keep playing, but, you know, start over all over again two or three times? Well, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I forgot Graveyard Keeper. That's the most recent one. I played that one for hours and hours, and then I was like, I'm done. There's more game. There's stuff to do. There's a lot of stuff to do, but I just done. So yeah, it happens it happens to all of us, I think. And sometimes it might not even be the game's fault. Like other people will be like, no, I have to get the next thing. Even though it's the last thing, only with more. Alright. That was all the mails. Wow, so that means we answered uh six questions this week. That's pretty good by our standards. Yeah. Hey, I you know what? In addition to being done with Factorio and City Skylines and Graveyard Keeper, I think we're done with this diecast. I think you're right. I think it's enough. Even if we haven't talked about all the stuff we could talk about, I think I'm losing interest in it. And I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to make myself a <laughs> promise that I'll come back to this diecast some point later, and then I never will. Oh man, that's so sad. We're never right? going to have we're never going to have this diecast ever again, Seamus. It can just that's half my Steam library, is things I'm going to get back to eventually, but actually not. So, if you would like to send a question into our doomed show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. So we did talk about Doom in the show, so it really is a Doomed show. Are we going to talk about right. Doom? Is this, is this just going to be Doom forever now? Is it, is it Doom Eternal?